Well, welcome everyone. Uh, this is the first of a two-part mini series on power mapping. And um, I love these topics. I mean, this is sort of the uh, vegetarian, the vegan meat and potatoes of organizing, right? Sort of how we identify targets and um, this is really the heart of, of uh, a good organizing campaign. Um, and, you know, you can do power mapping from the hyperlocal all the way up to the national and the international. So it's a very sort of transferable tool and there's a lot of content here. So um, we decided that it uh, would be better to split up this topic into two sessions. So today is the first session, and then we're going to skip a week because it's President's Day, and there's also the, yeah, the big Indivisible California gathering uh, next weekend. So we're going to do the second session on February 24th. So uh, stay tuned for that, and we're going to kind of walk through, you know, uh, more examples, more applications, and... Uh, you know, get into a little bit more detail in the second session. And if you guys would like to, um, you know, communicate about a topic or a campaign that you're working on that you want to talk through, um, just some, you know, questions around, maybe by the end of the session today, you might have some additional thoughts or inspirations about examples that you'd like to kind of workshop in this process, but we've got some really great um, examples kind of on, on deck for the next session. And um, in the uh, kind of meeting description, I was foreshadowing this project that I'm really, really excited about. And uh, so we're gonna have Aaron Fisher probably jump on on session two to share a little bit more about this project that he's working on um, that I'm not even going to tell you the name of it because it is, I'll wait for him to do the big reveal <laughs> this week, but, uh, I'm really excited about this project and, um, kind of it's, it's collaborative potential. So, uh, that's going to be on the 24th and then on March 3rd is, uh, the next in Emily's, uh, collaborative leadership series. So hopefully you guys have been, um, you know, participating in those webinars. I think she's, gosh, she must be on like number four or five at this point. Um, but they've been really wonderful kind of tools and processes to, you know, just help us become better leaders and, and the kind of leaders that, you know, are really experts in process and collaboration. So um, definitely highly recommend that series. She did one last week about monitoring, um, moderating Facebook groups and, and other kind of online spaces, which is huge and something that I think about a lot these days. Um, just by way of introduction, uh, my name is Karen May, and um, that segue was about uh, Rise Stronger because I'm one of the kind of lead admins for the Rise Stronger Facebook group, which has about 35,000 members in it and where uh, requires a lot of active moderating. So. Um, Emily's webinar on uh, digital spaces was really helpful for me. Um, so yeah, and Rise Stronger is kind of going through some transitions too. So stay tuned for kind of a, a new reboot, a name change and all kinds of um, new ways to engage with our content on kind of policy analysis and, and the kind of action that comes out of policy discussions. So that's coming up. And then, you know, so after the third, after Emily's webinar, um, we're going to have some more uh, sessions from Ragtag on kind of digital tools and skills. And uh, then also, uh, Aram's going to be doing a, a whole session on this kind of crowdsourced power map that I have been alluding to. So that's exciting. And then um, we're also going to be doing um, a session on the uh, ATN, the Action Together Network uh, and Sunday Network Assembly, big national gathering. So I'm really excited about that. Um, Andrea is in kind of silent mode today for the webinar, but uh, saying hello in the chat. And um, 
has you know put together this amazing collaborative team to to get all of our grassroots leaders together in Iowa. So I think it's like the last weekend in uh, August, I believe. So, yeah, the 22nd through the 25th. Really, really excited about that. So mark your calendars um, and save the date in your summer plans right now to come to Iowa for the major network assembly gathering in August. So um, I mentioned that my name is Karen and um, my whole thing is organizing and coalition building. So, um, and why am I so obsessed about coalition building? I, I, if you guys have been kind of tuned in with the Action Together Network and ATN Leaders Network for a couple of years now, maybe you caught the coalition webinar that we did uh, back in like September of 2017, if you can believe that. Um, and so why do I care so much about coalitions? Because really, not only is it about collaborating with each other and building community, it's really about building power and how we sort of understand the levers of power, how we can build power in our communities and um, really get to those decision makers that can uh, you know, shift that dynamic and, you know, basically mean success for our campaigns, whatever our, whatever our goal is. So the plan for today is um, to kind of go through the basics of power mapping and power analysis and just kind of, you know, what is it? How can we kind of wrap our heads around it? The motivation, kind of what is it useful for? Um, and uh, diff you know, kind of key elements, you know, we're not going to get into too much granularity today. We're going to wait for the second session to really talk through the, the details. Um, but, uh, but, you know, kind of want to get to those major chunks of work um, for, for what, you know, the power analysis project is about. Also, just really want to clarify that this is a kind of a set of tools, but there's no one prescription for how to do it. And it really depends on you and your organizations and really what you want to, um, to achieve what your goal is. And, and really, so I want to, you know, make, make it clear that you can kind of pick and choose from these tools that I'm going to, you know, kind of walk through and, and, you know, don't think that you're, there's never a wrong way to do it. You know, it's sort of like there's different ways to kind of plug into the sequence of steps, depending on what you're, you're working on. And then I just want to do a quick mention of uh, kind of the flip side of power mapping is really asset mapping. And this is not often kind of connected to the idea of, of power mapping. Sometimes it is, but it's sort of like the positive aspect of power mapping um, and sort of how we kind of take that community-based perspective on our our assets, our, our community assets, our community relationships. We're going to walk through a couple of the different visual tools and um, what they're useful for, kind of different phases of the process, and then kind of the basic steps. And if we have time, depending, we're going to uh, go through some, uh, some extra material on picking targets. We'll see how much time we have to walk through uh, that information. Just some, some additional tools. We might save it for the next session. So this is kind of where we get into it. Um, this is the key question, right? Who has the resources, the power, and the ability to influence our issue? What, what do we want to achieve? What is our goal? What's the, what's the issue we're trying to make progress on? And Who's making the decisions or are there multiple decisions and how can we understand if there are multiple decision makers, how do we get that? How do we number one, choose the best target for our activity? Um, and, you know, it can be multiple targets or it can be one, you know, one particular target. And then how do we understand sort of the pathway to move that person or institution or committee in the direction that that we want. So the great thing about this process and this set of tools is that it's not just about um, you know understanding 
you know, a, like a snapshot. It's a, it's a dynamic process because it basically sort of allows you to kind of back out of your goal and your target and kind of trace that pathway, follow the breadcrumbs all the way back to where you are now and so that you can see the pathway to how you get there. So this is kind of the central question that we're, that we're dealing with. So what is it? What are we talking about? What is power analysis? What is power mapping? And I'm kind of interchanging these terms. Um, power analysis is kind of like the, you know, the, the, the rectangle of power mapping is the square, you know, square is a rectangle, but a rectangle isn't always a square. So usually power mapping is, we kind of think about it as one of the tools in power analysis, but sometimes people use them interchangeably. Um, but, uh, but basically it's a set of tools and processes that help us analyze the power relationships. So how do we get there? Um, how do we create a strategy out of that? And usually when we think of power mapping, we are, we think about these visual tools, these visual diagrams and maps and network web diagrams. Um, I was kind of excited that uh, I, 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 kind of developed this new Power, PowerPoint template with the Sunday Network Assembly graphic, which I love. It's very networky. Um, and uh, let me see if my cursor will work. Yeah. So this, this whole background image, the Sunday Network Assembly logo that we have, this cool globe and all these little nodes, right? This is, it's very, it's what we're talking about. We're talking about all of these different connections and relationships and and uh, this kind of ecosystem of organizations and institutions that give us a sense of where is the power located in this, in this ecosystem. So it's always helpful to visually map that. I happen to be a really visual learner, a visual thinker. I kind of see everything in diagrams, and if I don't have a diagram, I get lost. Um, so this is one reason why I love this set of tools. Um, and it can be very, just very intuitive. We're talking about mapping relationships between people, organizations, institutions, to understand sort of where the, the value and the power is. Uh, and so, yeah, so why are we doing it? What's sort of the motivation? It's really a pathway to winning. It's all about winning. Why are we doing this? We want to win. You know, we wanted to flip the house. We want to do, you know, eventually we've got that big goal of, you know, winning in 2020 and really changing the dynamic in this country. Um, but, you know, whatever scale you're working at, um, we we're talking about, uh, you know, the object of our, of our campaign. Um, so how do we kind of understand those influential leverage points and the relationships that are going to be able to get to that key decision maker or decision makers? How do we identify the stakeholders, all of the potential allies, but not just the allies, also the obstacles. So that's another, uh, uh, you know, benefit to doing this where you don't just want to, you know, map out the people that are supporting you. You also want to map out the people that could sort of block you from winning. And, you know, it may be that you need to kind of head them off at the pass and, and address their power too. And what are the pathways to those key decision makers? You know, it's not just, you know, as I mentioned, the coalition building strategies to build power. So, you know, when you identify the stakeholders that are supporting you, how can you kind of organize all those folks together, all those organizations together to, you know, be that bigger fish that's going to have the influence on your target. Um, and it's not just, again, about the, the pathway itself, but it's also depending on sort of how the map, um, how the network kind of maps to different types of influential organizations or people, you know, that are connected to your decision maker, that is also going to help you determine what kind of strategies you're going to want to use. So, you know, it may be some kind of pressure tactic if you're trying to head off an, uh, somebody who's an obstacle, you may know that you're never going to convince them. You know, it's not going to necessarily help, um, you know, what you might make the decision that it's not going to help to, uh, you know, build a good relationship with that person necessarily in your local church or something like that. Um, it might be more kind of pressure oriented, but 
you know, it, you, it may be that the best way to, to develop that influence is to, you know, go on a hike with your local hiking club because you figured out that that decision maker, you know, loves the botanic garden and is going to go home for uh, the bird watching morning. And you just so happens that you like birds too. <laughs> you might just run into that person there. Um, and then of course, Last but not least, to do this whole exercise, and it is a little bit labor intensive, I'm not going to lie, you know, there's sort of multiple steps to it and, you know, definitely takes an investment in time, but it's great for community building in your own organizations because you're developing this shared understanding of what the strategy is. And the more people who really understand that goal and sort of what you're, what you're up to, um, the more successful you're going to be. And the more people are going to stay motivated and, and, uh, you know, take, take these actions together. So it's really, it, it really is a great community building exercise. So, okay. So here's kind of the, the piece about these different chunks of work that I almost hesitated to lay out in this way because, you know, it, it's so cyclical and kind of iterative. It's such an iterative process that, um, I'm going to move my little things so you can see see this little bottom corner here um, because you know you can kind of just throw a dart at this process and decide where to start and you know kind of follow the, the cycle around so um, you might want to start with just kind of a, a simple brainstorming um, process of, of listing out the stakeholders and, um, you know, kind of pick a target that you think you, you know, already, you might, you might kind of already have your top, your target pretty clearly defined what your you know, depending on what your issue is. And so it might be a pretty simple exercise to just kind of brainstorm and go ahead and uh, list out all of the stakeholders. And I'll, I'll give you guys a, a tool for doing that a little bit later in the presentation. Uh, and um, and then from there, once you have your target, that's kind of the, the the guts of the power mapping process. You're mapping out the stakeholders. You're mapping out, you know, graphically all of the different relationships and and the level of support and and where do they stand on the issue and and uh, well, really first it's mapping the relationships. So kind of defining those those relational lines. And then once you've just once you've kind of drawn the map itself, then you can kind of start to categorize the stakeholders into, you know, different, different types of, of stakeholders, depending on what your strategy is, you might want to group them into allies and opponents. You might also want to group them into um, kind of institutional categories too, depending on what strategy you're using. Um, so, you know, these are kind of the different as phases of the work or categories of the work, if you will. But really, it's this kind of cyclical process that I wanted to uh, to emphasize, because you're always going through this iterative process of defining the issue and then picking your target. You're mapping the relationships. You're categorizing them. But then, when you go back and look at it after you've done the categorization, after you've kind of drawn the the lines of relationship. And you, you might realize that your allies and opponents were kind of mapped in a different place than you, than you originally thought. And so you actually might want to pick a different target because what happens at that point is that these kind of, um, sometimes they refer to, the, to them as nodes of power kind of show up. They kind of emerge in the map. And that may actually mean that your target, that you're, that you're going to shift your target a little bit. So then you might need to sort of refine how you're defining the, the issue, the problem, the campaign, et cetera. And you're, so you're always going through this kind of refinement um, based on the work. And also once the campaign gets going and once you, once you start to have these meetings, it's also going to shift too. So your map, your map is going to change. You're going to, you know, develop better quality information the more meeting, meetings you have with people. So it's always kind of an ongoing process. And so this is what I was mentioning about kind of the flip side of um, power mapping is this idea of asset mapping. So 
Um, a lot of times it's kind of a community development and, and community organizing model that is kind of often taught um, that it, to kind of frame it in the positive, right? To not think about what we're missing, what, what, our, what we lack, what our deficits are, but to really start from that kind of positive framework of what are the existing assets, assets that already exist in our community? Do, you know, no matter how we're defining community and sort of what scale we're defining, um, we have, you know, skills, we have people, we have history, we have, you know, it might be even kind of moral authority, um, local associations, economic assets, certainly. So um, the idea is that, you know, you, you have this power map, which is kind of backing out of your ultimate goal, but then you also have the asset map which is starting from the community perspective, which is kind of going forward. And so ideally your power map and your community asset map are gonna kind of knit together at one point. You're gonna figure out like who, what relationships you have within your network that are gonna map onto these, you know, relational lines that, you know, start from your target and kind of work backwards. So that's really where, you know, it gets interesting and fun because you realize you actually do have some power. Um, so that's when the pathway, you know, you're kind of close, you're bridging that gap in the pathway from point A to point B to get to your ultimate goal. So there's sort of the, the visual tools in power mapping kind of fall into two types. And really, you can use both of these types really at any point along the way. They sometimes are, um, you know, more useful, I think, um, the, the kind of the graph, graphical type, um, kind of example on the left, is, is useful when you're really trying to understand the ecosystem when you're, you're first kind of getting started. Um, of course, you're going to refine it along the way, um, but it's really useful for picking targets and really understanding um, how much influence is, is possible. And um, so it's, it's, you can kind of think about it in terms of the, how to understand the power and influence of your, of your targets, the, the, you know, the, the ecosystem that relates more to your goal, your ultimate target. The network map, as I said, you're, you're always starting from this kind of center of the decision maker here. And it kind of, a lot of the uh, examples, a lot of the models will kind of use this idea of concentric rings. Um, you know, that's a good question. I'm gonna try to answer some of these questions if my devices work here. There's a question, are there websites or automated tools that you can input information and build out a network map for you? There are some really awesome uh, network mapping tools, which, uh, so the, answer, the, 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 the short answer is yes, but not exactly tailored to the kind of organizing model of power mapping. There are a lot of really great um, kind of network analysis tools. So that's different than power analysis and different than you know, power mapping, but network analysis is a whole huge, amazing science, which I adore. <laughs> and there's, I'm sure there might be other kind of network geeks out there. Um, and so I can, I can share some software that can um, kind of help you, uh, you know, get there. Some of it's free. There's one called, I think it's called Gephy, G-E-P-H-Y. I'll put a link uh, after in our follow-up to some of that software, but there aren't any that I have found, not that they don't exist. Maybe uh, we should we should start one, actually, that would be really cool, um, to, that are kind of tailored to do this network mapping for kind of community organizing purposes, campaign organizing purposes. So, um, but, you know, and, and again, there's so many kind of different ways to slice and frame these models that it's hard to find you know, kind of the one size fits all. A lot of them use this kind of concentric ring structure. So you're starting with the decision maker 
and then your your lines of influence um, you know fall into these different categories right so there might be co-workers friends business associates family media you know the kind of the public attention depending on what kind of decision maker it is they might be responding to the media you know we we, we all know somebody who spends his executive time <laughs> eight hours a day listening to the <laughs> influence of this little media bubble right here in one particular uh channel um so you know that's a very very clear power line there um but then again this is all about the kind of iterative process right because each of these friends in this little in this little bubble here this little category of influencers on your decision maker they also have friends and they also have co-workers and they also have family so this is how you eventually get to your pathway to that decision maker is kind of going out in these um, kind of self-similar network branches to get to a point where you actually have a connection there. So this very intuitive kind of visual tool is great uh, for, you know, again, understanding your power, where, where your power intersects with their power and how you get there. So, um, going back to that first type the graphical type usually the idea is that you'll have these two axes right and um you know usually one will relate to uh the kind of support axis like are they are they with you or against you and then the other axis will relate to how much power and influence do they have over over your issue or over your particular decision maker. This is why I was mentioning that you don't even necessarily have to have a target picked out when you're you're doing using this particular tool. I love these because it basically it it will help you see graphically where your kind of sweet spot is for um, what target you really want to go after. So um, you know you can kind of sometimes they'll map them into quadrants, right? So if it's somebody that you support or that supports your issue, but um, doesn't have a lot of power, they're gonna end up in this top left quadrant, right? But, or maybe they have a lot of power, but they oppose you, they're gonna end up down here, right? So that's somebody that you have to watch out for. Um, and, you know, you can sort of, determine your own level of detail that you want to kind of break these categories down into. So this one um, has the axes switched, but it, you know, it doesn't really matter. You can customize it yourself um, depending on how it, you know, intuitively makes sense for you. So on this, on this diagram, the interest is on the X axis influence on the influence and power on that Y axis. So um, you'll see kind of these, these, correlation trends right and if we kind of go back to the 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 other example right of this this chart here and then apply it you'll see on the left side actually the axes are switched for this the way this little matrix was set up on this other one was the axes were actually switched but um, but that's okay. Just pretend that uh, the y-axis is is power and the x-axis is support. So your champion loves you. So this the green chart is set up the same um, uh, structure as this one on the right here. So your your blocker is your opponent. They could literally block your campaign if they you know have their way. Um, and then your low influence, not too much power at all medium and high. So you'll see on the right, the way this kind of maps out, you get this kind of correlation that, you know, the more you are in the, that kind of top right zone. So, you know, it, you kind of, it, it, when you first look at it, it kind of seems like the top right is where you want to be. And certainly these are going to be your champions and your allies that are going to, really help you they might you know introduce your your bill they're gonna you know co-sponsor it for you they might be a really you know influential um you know powerful national organization that you can get on your side 
but it that's not necessarily the target that you are going after right like if you they they may have a lot of power they may be your ally but um it may be that somebody in kind of this zone this kind of mid-range zone is actually has more power in this situation from the perspective of kind of making or breaking the success of your campaign because they might be that all important swing vote. They might not be the chair of the committee, but they might be able to tip the scales. And so when you kind of start mapping out all of, you know, all of the different groups and individuals and this scale, that's really going to help you pick your target. So I'm going to give you one more tool later on um, that, uh, <laughs> my cat wants in on the action um that is going to kind of help you choose your target if we if we have enough time there so this starts to look really complicated but um but i love this example um this is a uh, actually from oxfam it's a kind of an international uh case study on the climate politics as oxfam determined um they were mapped out in 2009, right? So it'd be interesting to go through this and see how it's changed <laughs> at this point. Um, so um, you can see that they they did it in this kind of quadrant model, less of the kind of matrix and more a little bit more graphical. Um, so you've got your less powerful and very supportive up here in the top left. They're your climate champions, right? Um, and so what they did was uh, they, they, after every, all of these organizations were kind of mapped out in terms of their, their interest, their support level, they then kind of color coded them. So you can get pretty fancy with this. This would, the color coding kind of falls into that last stage of categorization when I was mentioning kind of the chunks of work. So once you have it all graphically mapped out, you can begin to kind of cluster these different actors and players and agents and see, you know, kind of where they fall, what kinds of clusters fall in which quadrant of, of the map. So the, these guys organized it by uh, the climate champions, the deal blockers, right? Who's going to stop that climate agreement from happening? Ooh, look at these players. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> Back in 2009, how things change and stay the same. Um, and then your deal makers, right? Your swing states and your deal makers, this is kind of where the action is, right? These are kind of where you wanna focus your lobbying activity, your relationship building activity there to get that deal done. So, but this doesn't necessarily show you the, the lines, right? The relational lines. This is where we get into some of the examples of the other type, right? Our, this is, was kind of this concentric ring idea. This is sort of the, the, the prettiest, the most orderly down here in the, um, in the, uh, the bottom right here with the decision maker in the center. And then you kind of concentrically go out in these rings going out from there. So this, you might want to start out with something just really simple like this. But, um, and then, you know, it doesn't have to be so symmetrical, right? Here's kind of a similar example, this top left example here, which is not quite as um, round, <laughs> but kind of gets at the same idea because you may start to sort of figure out that um, certain kinds of relationships don't have those, that same type of influencer in the next ring out, right? But you want to definitely kind of get them all out there um, in some kind of, you know, graphical visual form, because then the fun, the fun part begins. Um, and these two examples are just sort of different ways of drawing these kind of relational lines, right? So who knows who? So you're not just going out in these concentric rings out from the decision maker, but step two of this process is to figure out who of these outer nodes knows each other, right? So you kind of start to draw these lines and it may begin to look a little funky because you may have, this person knows somebody on the whole other side of the map over here. They get a little messy. And actually um, your question about that, the kind of fancy software, um, 
that's what that software is really, really good at. It'll sort of um, retool the graphical map to sort of minimize the distance between these relational lines. And uh, so that actually is a really, really cool feature. Um, now you've got me inspired to actually go back into that software and see if I can map some community power mapping on onto those uh, fancy software programs. This one is kind of the most uh, um, kind of clearest and well, this this one also has sort of multiple targets. Um, this was another of the kind of international uh, examples that I pulled um, that has the minister of something and the minister of something else uh, in the kind of decision maker um, center of the map here. And um, maybe, you know, they, they might both be important targets, right? But then there's these people out here that know each other. These people know this person, this person, this entity, well, it's the media, right? So this entity is, is influencing a whole bunch of people. So clearly it's sort of a, an important node to pay attention to right here. But what you start to see in, in this one, this graph in particular, is sort of where these important nodes begin to emerge out of this visual exercise of the mapping. Here's another important one, right? There's a bunch of arrows coming out of this little node here. So that's probably going to, you know, be somebody that's imp an important kind of step along the way when you're trying to ultimately get to this decision maker. Um, so let's see, we'll go, go through some of the steps uh, in, um, in, the, in the next uh, chapter too. So, uh, so here you go, some of the kind of steps here. Starting with your decision maker in the center, I have already been kind of talking about all this stuff. The concentric rings, you're drawing the connection to the target itself, but also between the influencer and then kind of going out from there, right? This kind of branching structure of these re relational lines. But this one doesn't show exactly how this person over here, if you could, hope you guys can see my cursor. If this person over here actually knows this person over here, right? That's an important line to, to draw there. And that's how you discover these nodes of power, um, as, as they're sometimes called. Use pencil, right? <laughs> You're going to want to erase this uh, diagram and map multiple times until you kind of figure out the right relationships. Um, and again, it's sometimes it's helpful to start with a kind of just a brainstorm list and then map out the connections and, and figure out those, those clusters of of influence. Um, one, one, another tip that you might want to think of too is to use post-it notes, right? Like if you're doing this in a meeting, I would suggest using either actually a white, whiteboards are fantastic, right? You can just kind of keep erasing as you go on giant whiteboards. Um, so uh, that's kind of my favorite um, mode of recording. But if you're using like butcher paper or something like that, um, little sticky notes, you know, or sort of like the big size sticky notes so that you can just kind of move them around as your nodes change and um, as your map kind of begins to become clear, you want to kind of get those clusters together, like make sure your nodes are, are sort of geographically visible with all those lines. So it's nice to have some tools just from a very practical sense that you can move around a lot. Um, and again, this is an iterative process. You're starting from that center decision maker, but each influencer has their influencers, they have their influencers, they have their influencers, and eventually you're gonna be you know, looking at an influencer that somebody in your group knows, right? That's where it starts to get really exciting. That's when your asset map bridges that power map, and you, and you, you know, then it's useful to catalog Every single member of your organization, who do they know? What organizations are they a part of? Little League, soccer, those are huge. Oh my gosh, parent networks are amazing. And they have that kind of, you know, oftentimes kind of cross-cultural, cross-political, um, organizational quality to them. It's a, it, parent groups are amazing for, for these exercises. So, uh, this is a great tool that, 
you know, somewhere falls kind of somewhere in between <laughs> the kind of the graphical type and the uh, the list and the uh, the mapping type. You've still got your decision maker in the center, but this is really helpful for just kind of beginning beginning the process, right? Just kind of understanding all of the different potential influencers on your decision maker. So. Uh, you've got your your public influences, the media, the general public, voters, um, specific kind of geographical bodies, organizational affiliations. These are all kind of, you know, publicly available stuff. Um, and then you've got the personal influences. Church is a huge one. You know, what organizations do they belong to? Um, you know church, synagogue, mosque, whatever denomination, it's really useful to know. There's some amazing um, golf clubs, country clubs, oh my gosh, huge. Um, and then of course you've got the VIP influencers, right? Like who, who is this person, who are the consultants? Who are the uh, consigliaries that this person is relying on? Um, they may be kind of subject matter experts. They might be, uh, you know, important businesses. Um, you know, th these people are going to be pretty clear, but then, oops, sorry, my cursor got ahead of me. Of course, then this last one is, you know, super important, right? Follow the money. Who are the financial influencers? Uh, campaign contributors, investors, consumers. That's one that we don't necessarily think about, competitors. So here's the other thing. You know, we, we, we talk a lot about um, kind of this process in kind of a legislative lobbying kind of perspective, but you can also use it uh, for, uh, you know, private campaigns as well. I mean, I, can, I come from a labor background myself. I used to work for Cesar Chavez and the United Farm Workers, and, and uh, um, I've been kind of have family connections to SEIU, the Service Employees International Union. All this kind of stuff is, you know, just classic campaign planning, right? It doesn't have to be a, a public um, legislator or, or a elected official or, or a, you know, public sphere, public sector person that is your, your target. You may be, you know, trying to, uh, you know, stop a, a particular corporation from putting a big development in your neighborhood or in your in your city that's you know so going to be an environmental disaster or whatever it is all of this applies right um who's making the decisions to locate that plant um in your you know or whatever whatever it is in your area um and uh you know who are the investors how do you how do you find the key stockholders that are going to influence that company and so these, this, this little piece down here is just some useful instructions. Who has the power to decide? Um, and so you can start to even begin that kind of visual mapping process, even, even with a simple tool like this, to you know, circle the ones that have the most influence. And then who do you have access to, right? Like how does your asset map bridge the power map? And um, so you know, putting some other kind of signifier on... Uh, you know, those entities that you might have a connection to. So here's some of the key, key steps. So um, we're gonna break all this down really in the, in the next session. We're gonna go through it step by step and, and talk through a bunch of examples. Um, but, you know, it's it pretty intuitive, I think, at this point. The, you're, first, you want to determine what your issue is, what your policy focus is, um, what scale you're working at. So this is really, number one, is about defining the problem. And, and it, you know, it seems obvious, but actually, once you kind of start to do this map, you may discover that you want to kind of redefine how you're framing your issue and, and what your actual goal is. What does success look like? That's really the, the key to think about. Um, you know, it's kind of gets into vision, mission, goal kind of territory, right? Defining the problem is really the first step. Determining the targets um, that we've been talking about, and we, we might have time to go over uh, some of that stuff actually today. Um, and then, so next step, kind of the heart of it, identify and map out the influencers of that target. 
these steps, by the way, are, are a little bit more aligned with the, the kind of, you know, visual network mapping um, part of the process. I think when people talk about power mapping, they're generally talking about doing those kind of that, the, that relational mapping, right? Um, discovering those lines of relationship and, and, and what's our pathway to, to power through those points of, of leverage. Um, so, you know, again, these steps don't exactly map onto every single campaign. And, and if you're starting out with that other kind of graphical model, kind of doing the quadrant thing to understand the landscape, it, it doesn't quite apply, but, um, you know, you could do like the, the graphical analysis, the more, which is more of kind of like a power analysis, more than a power mapping, I guess you could say, kind of between step one and two, right? That's when it's really useful. Uh, and then map out your influencers, um, those lines, those relational lines, um, how they all connect with each other. And then you start to figure out how you wanna target um, those, those relationships, really what you're going to do, right? Once you kind of see the pathway, once you see how your, uh, you know, asset map, your community asset map bridges that power map and you, that path becomes clear, that's when you start to kind of target the pathway, target the relationships along the way to, um, to your decision maker. And, and then of course, making a plan. How are you gonna actually build the relationships or put pressure on each of the targets that, that you determine? So um, let's see, I am gonna go for it. I'm gonna go for uh, um, just another tiny bit of, of content here. Uh, let's see. Oh, Marsha asks, yes, just curious, has this process been used for, gui for guiding coalition building? Absolutely, that's exactly what we're talking about here. So you'll see that a little bit more clearly next in the next session when we actually look at the map because um, it's really about how we gather power, right? So um, sometimes people break down power mapping into coalition building versus lobbying. I don't really like that breakdown because I feel like it's all part of the same thing because really the coalition building is a kind of a means to an end of, you know, changing your decision makers actions or behavior, right? So you're, you're building the coalition for the purpose of reaching whatever influencer you identify along that pathway, right? And you may need to, to build a coalition to get to that like very first node on the power map, you know, like it may be a heavy lift to bridge your asset map to your power map. So you may need to really think about how you're gonna build a coalition of a bunch of different interest groups to influence that influencer that then is gonna be able to, to, to you know, influence that decision maker, if that makes sense. So then, so when you're determining your target, right? Um, so you can use this kind of in parallel with uh, that kind of quadrant mapping process, the graphical matrix process. Um, it's really kind of, this, this phase is sort of like step two, after it sort of becomes clear that you know kind of where your swing decision makers are, like who you're gonna go after. Um, this, is gonna, this is gonna help you really get to that next level um, and really is actually gonna help you uh, in, the, in the mapping, in the network mapping process too. So you could call it the target prioritization matrix if you like, <laughs> but basically you're kind of, thinking through, does it make sense to choose, you know, Congresswoman X or Senator Y or, you know, CEO Z? And you're going to ask a series of question, questions to not just understand sort of their, um, you know, kind of their, their place in that, in that matrix, right? In the, in the kind of the quadrant map, 
the graphical quadrant map, but also really what is their accessibility? How, how accessible are they? So this is really going to help you define who to choose. So here's some sample questions. Knowledge of the issue. Um, do they support you? Accessibility is going to you know, include a whole set of variables. Their, their vulnerability. Um, you know, do they have any skeletons in their closet? You know, not that you want to go negative, but it's always, you know, helpful to have your oppo research in, in your back pocket just in case, you know, just for a rainy day. <laughs> um, are they open to changing their opinion? You know, people are going to be much more open to conversations in informal settings, right? Um, think about those parent networks. Think about the soccer game. Think about that mountain hiking group. Um, I'm choosing all kinds of California outdoorsy things, but maybe in, on the East Coast, in New England, you have a different set of those kinds of activities. Um, so these are important, important questions to think about. Could you neutralize their opposition? How and how? What issues do they care about? What are their priorities? Is there a way to kind of piggyback on some of their key issues? That's super helpful to know. What other committees are they on? What are their pet issues? Do they have a family member? who was affected by mental illness or whatever the issue is, um, you know, you, that might be, that might come into play. You know, you might be at a fundraiser for a completely different issue that um, where you, you know, again, it's that bridge between your asset map and your power map. Uh, do they know your organization? Do you have uh, clear allies? Um, What's their rank in the committees? These are these questions are kind of organized around legislative um, committees and that sort of thing. Um, but you know, you're going to develop the questions around accessibility, knowledge, and vulnerability that are you know customized to your your particular campaign and issue. So this you know is sort of the the more granular version of both of those other uh, examples here. So it looks like after you analyze all of these questions for all of your different targets, you found in your kind of, you know, quadrant map graph that these swing voters emerge. So target B, C, D, and E are all potential targets here, right? They're all in the maybe category. You figured out that this person is just a no, uh, just a no go, right? But all of these these folks could could be influenced. So then it's a question of accessibility, how you're answer, answering all the other questions. So look at this. Look at this one. You have a whole bunch of your organizational members that live in this district or this this area, right? So this becomes a really clear target. This is where your asset map really matches your power map. So based on, you know, all of these answers, you decide to go after target C. And then you put this person in the middle of your network map. So that is pretty much where we are. Gosh, I can't believe we ended like just exactly <laughs> with enough time to uh, to go over some some questions. Uh, hey, Susan. I figured if you're going to unmute us, we might as well come on screen if we got cameras. Excellent. It's so nice to see you. <laughs> new, new friend and ally in my region, for those of you guys that uh, don't know Susan. <laughs> Although it seems like pretty much most everyone along the 210 corridor already knows Susan. Um, so, uh, yeah, basically, we are kind of at the end of our content for today, but would love to get questions from everybody. Um, we're going to go over all of those steps. So all of these, all of these steps, we're going to go over, go over in the next session, talk through some examples, and like actually dig into the mapping itself. And then we're going to hear about this giant crowdsourced map that I'm super excited about. 
yeah, so mark your calendars for February 24th. And um, yeah, Susan, do you have a, a question? Or a comment? Or just popping in well, to say hi? <laughs> I just, I think that I'm seeing, I'm seeing a potential for this, like, oh yeah, we could do this in my democratic club to accomplish this, or we can, you know, we, we haven't done an asset thing, um, which, or, you know, and I'm even thinking about this for a personal family issue with, with somebody, you know, somebody that my family is, is dealing with and it's like oh yeah you know an intractable situation this might be a way of approaching it so there i i see the potential yeah i'm so glad you brought that up because these are tools that can be applied to to anything to any mm -hmm. personal situation you know a, you know as i mentioned either a private company or what whatever you're trying to achieve really i mean they're just really right. useful tools. right I have a I have a question that just occurred to me. Um, yeah, this is a this is a brainstorming together with other people so that so that more more brains um, and and thoughts coming together bring bring something out. And would you talk about what you think is sort of like a good minimum number of people for an activity? And and uh, what's the maximum? At one point, this does having you know x number of people in the room become too cumbersome i you know i think for a like a democratic club or a grassroots group i think it's it, that's i don't think that's too cumbersome um uh how many members are in your club <laughs> are you thinking like yeah I, I'm just thinking of a of a starting point. I mean, a starting point is you get two people doing this, and then you say, "Okay, let's let's take this let's yeah. take this larger." And at one point, are you going to say, "You know, no way, too I mean, much." I think you know, twenty people is not too many, really. If you have a good facilitator, mm -hmm. uh, you know, probably more than that would get a little bit cumbersome. It does it does definitely require some some facilitation for sure, but it's such a uh, kind of brainstorm like exercise that um, you know I I always think it's really useful for for everybody to kind of um, start by with a little kind of introduction and tutorials so that everybody understands what the definitions are and kind of how the process works but after that to not be too structured about it and to kind of have even all of the tools that's why i love whiteboards actually because you can have the tools kind of side by side simultaneous so somebody might have a you know a thought about what that they think is you know belongs on the kind of network map but really it probably makes more sense to kind of think through that ecosystem on the on the quadrant power analysis diagram so um you know, I think as, as non-linear as possible. And so it's really nice to have more, more, you know, more bodies, more brains working on it because, you know, the, you start to, to get creative. It's just that, it's that creative soup. So I would say mm -hmm. that there's kind of a um, sweet spot there, probably, um, you know, between five and 15, maybe somewhere in there. Mm -hmm. But you know, no rules. If it works for you, and if you have really good facilitators, or uh, right, and it may be that you you start with you start with two or three just to say let's let's wrap ourselves around this before we make it go big. Right. 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 Exactly. I mean, it's, you know, power mapping one hundred and one. You're going to start. You don't start in a group of twenty. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, certainly it's helpful for everybody to sort of have the background, you know, as I said, I, I think, you know, whatever kind of complicated process you're going through with an organization like that, I'm, I'm actually um, working with our um, local Rancho Cucamonga Democratic Club on a strategic planning process that's, you know, a multi month process and we spent an entire rainy afternoon just talking through the definitions of the different categories and how we were going to approach the process. I think it's really helpful because everybody's starting from the same definitions and mm -hmm. um, it's worth the investment and the time. 
thank you so much, um, everyone. And um, we're about uh, four minutes over over time, but um, so we'll I'll let you guys go and enjoy your Sunday evening. But please uh, mark your calendars for. Um, the 24th, we are recording this session. So if you're registered, we'll send a link to the recording and, and uh, hopefully it'll be posted in, in a few of the, the groups in, in um, ATN Leaders and some of the other Facebook groups. And uh, so if you have folks in your groups that were not able to join today, um, but really want to kind of get into the nitty gritty of it, um, you can definitely you know refer them to the recording, it's not going to be you know required to do this kind of basic intro before we we do the second second session, but it might be might be helpful. So we will send that out. So thank you so much, everyone. Um, really appreciate all of you, and um, have a great night. See se puede, and uh, we will see you on the flip side on the twenty fourth. Take care. Bye.